This module has been one of the more difficult ones to compile because the insect pests that attack roots of landscape plants are often poorly studied and rarely covered in textbooks. However, I feel that they are an extremely important group to know about. The problem with this group is that their damage occurs out of sight, and attacked plants generally show symptoms of poor health. That is, plants will grow slower than expected, and their foliage often shows symptoms of poor nutrition. And even worse, about the only way to confirm root-eating pests is to dig the plant up. Finally, many of the root-eating pests are active at levels in the soil where insecticide treatments, even drenches, can't reach. This module will concentrate on three groups of insects, the root-eating weevils, a small group of longhorn beetles, and the white grubs. There are also sucking pests that attack roots, but I'll cover those in later modules. There are 14 known species of root weevils in the genus Odiorhynchus that attack roots of ornamental plants in North America. All are invasive species and most have come from Europe. Another interesting feature of these weevils is that many of the more important species are all female. That is, they reproduce parthenogenically. These weevils are in the group of Curculionids that are known as broad-nosed weevils. If you look at the heads of the weevils illustrated here, you will see that they have the typical snout of a weevil, but the snout is relatively short and doesn't end in a point. They also have the elbowed antennae that is typical of weevils. Three of the most common species found in our landscapes are the black vine weevil, which is one of the larger species. The rough strawberry root weevil is slightly smaller and adults usually have more evidence of bumps on the pronotum. The smallest species is the strawberry root weevil. This species is most common in nurseries where seedling trees are grown. These three species are generally black in color. Not shown here is the clay-colored root weevil, which is also known as the raspberry root weevil. This species is about the same size as the rough strawberry root weevil, but the body is covered with clay-brown colored scales. Here are some images of the actual weevils so that you can get an idea of their color. As we mentioned in the earlier modules of leaf-eating insects, all of these root weevils are leaf notchers as adults. Their common names are also a bit deceptive as these weevils generally have broad host ranges, both as adult foods and as larval foods. Since the larvae often feed on the roots and crowns of strawberries and raspberries, their common names are reflective of this. In the nursery industry, the black vine weevil is often called the taxus weevil because it can build up large populations in taxus production. When taxus plants are grown in clean, weed-free soils, the weevil larvae often will girdle plants. Black vine weevils also attack potted perennial plants, and when the plants are kept under the protection of plastic for the winter, the soil can be warm enough for the larvae to completely devour the dormant plant roots during the winter. The result is a bunch of dead plants that aren't discovered until the following spring. I'll use the black vine weevil as my example to discuss the life cycle. This weevil occasionally overwinters as new females that emerge late in the previous season. Actually, this weevil can be an occasional home invader in the fall, though houseplants can be infested if the plants were placed outside for the summer. The largest part of the population usually overwinters as nearly mature larvae. These develop rapidly in the spring when soil temperatures are sufficiently warm for them to be active. When they finish feeding, they pupate in the soil near host plants. The new adults join the successfully overwintered adults to feed on plant leaves, usually in May and June. The females generally have to feed for two to three weeks before they are ready to lay eggs. The females feed at night and hide in the litter under plants during the day. When ready to lay eggs, they deposit a few eggs each day in moist soil under favored plants. The females can actively feed and lay eggs for two or more months. 
Now that we have covered the life cycle of the black vine weevil, let's look at management strategies. In general, most management, whether in landscapes or in nursery, are to target the adults in the spring as they do their maturation feeding and before maximum egg production begins. For landscapes and open fields, the adults are usually feeding on plant foliage in late May into early June. Foliar applied insecticides are often effective at taking out most of the adults when applied at this time. In nurseries, pitfall traps are often scattered around the fields and when the first adults are trapped, sprays are made. The traps are usually maintained for a month to determine if late emerging adults may also need to be treated. In landscape, the presence of newly notched leaves on plants is a sign that treatments will effectively reduce the adult population. You've probably noticed that this chart also has a larval treatment window. This is only recommended for containerized plants, especially perennials with thick tap roots or woody ornamentals in containers. In this case, drenches are used to ensure that the entire soil is infused with insecticide so that larvae that may be feeding deep in the soil pot are exposed. In general, most of the root weevils cause plants to grow slowly and display symptoms of nutrient deficiency, usually yellowing of the foliage. However, when excessively large populations occur, the larvae will eat most of the roots and they then turn to nibbling on the phloem and cambium of the central root and stem. This can also happen when there are fewer larvae but the soil is saturated. Heavy rains in the fall and spring can force the larvae up to the main plant stem to feed and this can girdle the plant. This often occurs under the cover of mulch in landscapes. Girdle plants suddenly wilt and die, usually in the spring, and uneducated plant managers may think that voles or other rodents have nibbled away the bark. There are three longhorn beetles that have larvae that attack roots of trees and shrubs and all belong to the genus Prionis. In eastern North America, the broadneck root borer and tile Prionis are common species that attack a wide array of deciduous trees. The broadneck root borer is also a pest of old grapevines. West Coast states have the California Prionis which attacks a wide range of native trees as well as eucalyptus, apple, prunus, and walnuts. These beetles generally attack mature trees that likely already have some root decay. The females push their ovipositors into the soil surrounding potential host plants. Upon hatching, the larvae dig their way to the tree roots and begin feeding on the root surfaces. As the larvae grow, they eventually enter the large buttress roots of a tree, which can cause considerable decay and allows for invasive root fungi to gain entry into the tree. The larvae can take three to four years to complete their development, and multiple larvae can destroy most of the root system of even a large tree. This makes the tree highly susceptible to being blown over in a wind or ice storm. When this happens, it may be the only time that the boar larvae are discovered. Because the larvae are deep in the soil, no insecticide treatments are registered for these pests. White grubs are the larvae of scarab beetles that live and feed in the soil. They are thick-bodied larvae that have adopted a distinctive C-shape. They generally have white or cream-colored bodies with brown to black head capsules. The thorax has obvious legs which help separate these robust larvae from weevil larvae. When feeding, the end of the abdomen has a gut cecum that appears dark with food remains. Most of the turf infesting grub species actually feed on the thatch, a layer of dead and decomposed plant matter on the surface of the soil. Since turf roots and crowns are also in this zone, the grubs sever and eat these plant tissues also. The result is dead turf. When sufficient grubs are present to kill the turf, the dead turf layer on top can often be lifted like a loose carpet. Most white grubs are also highly prized by skunks, raccoons, armadillos, wild boars, and even some birds. 
A few grub species like European chafer, oriental beetles, and Asiatic garden beetles seem to like to feed on more fibrous roots of trees, shrubs, and perennials. So they can often be found around these plants. White grub adults can also lay eggs in nursery pots or they can be present in the soil surrounding nursery plants. Most are considered quarantine pests, so mere grub presence can stop a sale of plants that are to be shipped to other states. White grub adults are typical scarab beetles. These beetles have robust bodies and lamellate antennae. That is, the antennae that end in a club of several flat plates that fit together. In North America, about a dozen species have grubs that are known to commonly damage turf grass from Canada to Mexico. The native May June beetles, green June beetle, and several species of mass chafers commonly attack lawns, and the tiny Atenius and Aphodius beetles occur in the highly maintained turf of golf courses. Remember that the introduced European chafers, oriental beetles, and Asiatic garden beetles are ones that feed on the roots of ornamental plants, and these, plus the Japanese beetle, are considered to be quarantine pests. While the adult beetles are pretty easy to identify, it is the grubs and soil that are usually discovered, and identifying these is a bit more difficult. White grubs in North America are fairly easy to identify using what is called the raster pattern. The raster is the undersurface of the last abdominal segment. The raster usually consists of some long hairs and short stout bristles that are usually arranged in a specific pattern. This pattern is usually easy to see by holding the grub between your thumb and forefinger with its head facing towards you and the tip of the abdomen facing upward. With a 10 power or 15 power hand lens, you should be able to see the pattern of bristles on the raster. In the case of the Japanese beetle, their raster has a V-shaped pattern. The mass safer grubs don't have a distinctive pattern, but they have just a random arrangement of the stout bristles. All white grubs have the same stages that insects with a complete life cycle have. That is, egg, larva, which is the white grub, pupa, and adult. All also have three larval instars. As you can see in this image, the third instar grub is the largest and is also the most damaging because it needs to eat a lot more than the first instar grub. And, on the other hand, the last instar grub is the most difficult to control, partially because it is often 20 to 30 times the body weight of the first instar grub that hatches from the egg. I'll use this colorized illustration of the Japanese beetle annual life cycle to discuss the general life cycle of the white grubs that are most commonly found in our landscapes. While some of the May-June beetle species take two to five years to complete their development, most of the grubs of concern have annual life cycles. The adults of these pests generally emerge in June and July. While the Japanese beetle adults feed on the leaves of trees, shrubs, and flowers, most of the other species merely emerge at night, mate, and go back into the soil to lay their eggs. The Japanese beetle females will undergo several feeding and egg-laying bouts. The eggs take a little over two weeks to hatch, and the tiny first instar grubs dig to the surface of the soil where the highest amount of organic matter is found. They will feed at the soil thatch interface for about three weeks, then dig back into the soil to molt. After molting, the second instar moves back up to feed for another three weeks. By September, these grubs molt again into the third instars. In most locations, the third instars are nearly mature in the fall, and they then dig deeper into the soil to avoid predation for the winter. In the spring, the successfully overwintered grubs move back up to the soil thatch interface and finish whatever feeding is needed. They then drop back into the soil and form a pupal chamber. The pupa takes three to four weeks to form the new adults. It appears that the major factors regulating white grub populations are available of suitable organic matter and soil moisture, especially at the time of egg laying. 
Most of the white grub species emerge at night, mate, and the females dig back into the soil to lay their eggs. Japanese beetles are the major exception to this in that the adults are active during the day. In all cases, the adults of all the species lay dehydrated eggs. These eggs have to absorb moisture from the surrounding soil in order to develop. This is why grub populations generally decrease during years when drought occurs at the time of egg lay. <clears throat> Unfortunately, landscapes that are regularly irrigated and kept green are always at a higher risk of having damaging grub populations. The European chafer is still only found in the extreme northeastern area of North America. It is most common in Quebec and Ontario provinces and from the New England states across to Michigan and northern Ohio. Adults emerge in early June at dusk and fly to nearby trees where mating occurs. However, the adults don't eat tree leaves like the May June beetles do. After mating, the beetles fly back to the soil and dig in. Mated females lay eggs in moist soil that contains a fair amount of organic matter. These often end up in flower beds, especially ones with thick mulch layers. The larvae move more than other grub species and they seem to like dining on the roots of trees, shrubs, and perennial plants. The grubs are often concentrated around flower beds. The grubs have a Y-shaped anus and the raster pattern consists of two parallel rows of bristles that diverge at the anus. Oriental beetles are also found in the northeastern states over most of the same territory as the European chafer. The adults vary considerably in color ranging from light tan to almost black. They fly at dusk and commonly feed on composite flowers. Like all grubs, the females lay dehydrated eggs that need to absorb moisture from soil in order to develop. This species feeds on a wide array of plant roots and has been found increasingly in soybean and alfalfa fields. The grub's raster pattern consists of two rows of small bristles with a row of larger bristles next to these. This pest is very common in nursery pots containing perennial flowers and grown outdoors. The Asiatic garden beetle is another introduced annual white grub that seems to prefer the roots of trees, shrubs, and flowers. It is expanding its territory but is still most common in northeastern North America. The adults are small reddish brown beetles that also fly at night. Supposedly the adults feed sparingly on tree leaves. The grub is smaller than most and has an enlarged maxillary palp that is easily visible under the head capsule. The grub raster pattern is unique with a vertical anal slit and a transverse row of bristles. The larvae of this species is very commonly found in mixed flower beds and under the drip lines of both deciduous and coniferous trees. The green june beetle is one of the more interesting species of white grubs, biologically. I could have put this species in several different sections, but I decided to keep it here with the other white grubs. This native of North America is found east of the Rocky Mountains, but there is another species in the same genus that occurs in Southern California. The beetles are large iridescent green and they fly with a buzzing sound during the day. Adults feed on ripe fruits, tree wounds, and even on tree leaves where they leave behind skeletonized patches. The larvae are the largest of our landscape grubs and when exposed they crawl on their backs. The grubs are also unique in that they feed on grass blades at nighttime, not the thatch, roots, or crowns of grasses. The larvae make a base burrow that can extend six to eight inches into the soil. They emerge from these burrows on warm nights to eat grass blades. The larvae also have a stink gland which protects them from mammal predators. Besides being big and crawling on its back, the green june beetle grub has many fine hairs that cover the tip of the abdomen and the raster has two irregular rows of stout bristles. Notice that the larvae don't kill turf, but their nighttime grazing can really thin it out. 
The grubs also periodically push out soil from their burrows, especially after heavy rains or in the spring when they clean out their overwintering burrows. This grub occasionally is found in flower beds along where turf has been growing. This grub occasionally is found in flower beds near where turf is being grown. Apparently the females are attracted to the odors of decaying wood fibers to lay their eggs. In this old USDA life cycle chart of the green June beetle, notice that the adults tend to fly in July and August, a bit later than the other annual white grub species. The females are highly attracted to moist soil with a high amount of organic matter. Lawns that have been fertilized with manure and other organic sources can be very attractive. The females lay a batch of eggs in a capsule of soil that is held together with a secretion. Apparently this helps the eggs to properly hydrate. Occasionally when people discover this really big grub in their landscape, they panic and try to control it with pesticides. Unfortunately, the grubs contact these insecticides when they come to the surface and that is where they die. There is nothing more alarming than finding hundreds of big, dead, and rotting white grubs littering a lawn, sidewalk, and driveway the morning after applying a grub control treatment. You're probably wondering why I put a picture of a wasp in this module. Scolodubia is a large hairy wasp that parasitizes the green June beetle larvae. The wasps can emerge in great abundance in August and they search for four to six weeks for green June beetle grubs. Because they are a wasp of impressive size, they get many inquiries about what they are and how dangerous are they. The adults feed on pollen and nectar and when the female is ready to lay eggs, she will fly back and forth over soil infested with green June beetle grubs. She will occasionally land on the turf or soil and disappear among the grass blades. If she finds a green June beetle burrow, she will enter the burrow and apply a paralyzing sting to the grub. Once the grub has been immobilized, she will attach a single egg. Apparently the grub recovers from the sting and resumes its behavior, but the wasp grub that hatches embeds its head into the body of the grub and begins extracting hemolymph for food. Eventually the grub stops feeding and remains in the burrow while the wasp larva eventually eats most of the grub. The wasp then pupates in the soil. <clears throat> In answer to the sting question, the females can sting but won't do so unless provoked by trying to pick them up. 